right. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Mael Genu, fr also from uh, University of Luxembourg. We'll be talking on displacement of anti-ferroelectric transitions in a particular case. Okay. <clears throat> so, can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Okay. So, this is a second talk from Luxembourg and second talk in the antiferroelectrics, and actually quite a nice uh, experimental counterpart as well to what Jorge has been, has been uh, talking about. Uh, in the sense that I, um, I've been focusing recently on this kind of exotic compound and essentially arguing that it gives us a nice example of uh, such a displacive antiferroelectric transition, so soft mode driven. So I want to get into this story uh, today. Uh, just before I start, uh, let me just acknowledge some uh, contributors here. So essentially all the uh, theoretical work is also done by Jorge and Hugo. Um, the, the previous speaker, then uh, this is for the spectroscopy experiment, and we are also very much working uh, with uh, Ivan Constable in Vienna for all the crystals and, and some other stuff, and then obviously we'll have uh, Helmut Berger for the crystal growth, extremely important, and the ESRF uh, people from the inelastic uh, X-ray scattering. So those are the people involved. So essentially, the, the motivations and the general questions that we have are pretty much the same, and you could say simply uh, what what is an antiferroelectric material? Can we find a proper definition that makes everyone happy and that's also sound and consistent? And one way to tackle this question is to wonder what kind of model antiferroelectric anti materials do we have? And there, I mean, typically, if we make a poll in this kind of community, it's lead zirconate that comes up at the first model material. But Jorge has, in has insisted on the fact that it's a very complex case. Uh, so I usually say that studying lead zirconate is extremely interesting if you want to learn about lead zirconate. But as a model antiferroelectric material, it's quite unsatisfying. So this is also the driving uh, force behind all this work, and why Jorge is essentially trying to go through these high throughput calculations. I'm going through a high throughput literature search, so to speak, and find uh, examples that would be likely to provide simple examples. So obviously, in terms of models, I don't need only one. I need at least two. And this is because if I make a comparison with ferroelectrics, we typically uh, di distinguish between order disorder and displacive transition in ferroelectrics. And for that, I mean, in ferroelectrics, it's, it's known. So without going into details, there's, there's a lot of order disorder transition. This is just an example for uh, this uh, sodium nitrite, for example. And for displacive transition, the typical one is probably a titanate. And this is also well known uh, for quite some time. Now, if I want to go to antiferroelectric material and I want to cast them into this kind of classification, it gets a bit more uh, complicated. Here is a bunch of uh, examples uh, that you could find in the literature. So this is lead zirconate, I'm not elaborating on that. And those are other examples that you will find uh, in the literature as typical antiferroelectrics. Although I have to point out that uh, typically in those two cases, I'm not aware that a double cycle has ever been measured. Mm. Uh, so this is KCN, this is a typical hydrogen bonded material. There's been also uh, some reports of antiferroelectric behavior or potential antiferroelectric behavior in those hybrid perovskites a bit more recently. And I like advertising for this ascaric acid, which is one of the few examples uh, that's been really nicely characterized at the, exper at the experimental level with uh, like everything, the dielectric anomaly, uh, the uh, first principle calculations, and uh, the field-induced phase transition. But then if I go back to my classification, essentially I can put many things in there, then I have all those complex cases like lead zirconide, but here I'm not really aware of any example that's a nice realization uh, of that. So I don't mean that th there is no reference to antipolar soft modes. I mean, if you browse the literature, you will find uh, this mentioned, but never in a way that is so simple as to be an antiferroelectric equivalent of, of lead titanate, something as a soft mode phase transition. So essentially, that's uh, the search. And uh, looking for that, I came to this uh, compound, which is a bit exotic and with comparatively complex chemistry. So let me go through a quick presentation of this compound. So it's, uh, it belongs to a family called the francisite. Um, essentially, you can see it as some copper oxide planes here. In between, you would have those uh, selenate ions. Bismuth is here, and you have some chlorine in between. Okay? 
when you look at it from the top, so along, uh, along the C axis, you see that it realizes this kind of hexagonal Kagome lattice, and this is the reason why uh, this family has been investigated so far. It's because from this kind of lattice, you will find intrastic uh, magnetic uh, frustration and mechanism. So this is the reason why people have been looking into uh, those materials. So essentially, this one, it has an orthorhombic structure. All the magnetism happens at low temperatures, 25K in that particular case. And this one happens to have a phase transition at uh, 115K. Um, with perovskites, we like very much making cation substitution. This is also something you can do. So typically, what people have been doing is to substitute this uh, bismuth by the rare earth, classically. Selenium here can be substituted by tellurium, and this chlorine can be substituted with other halogenes. So there's been a bunch of compounds uh, explored along that lines. In all cases, the high symmetry structure is the same, so this doesn't change much. When you play around with it, I mean, you change the magnetism, certainly, especially if you start uh, adding some magnet magnetic uh, rare earth here on this side. But this particular phase transition, it's really only uh, for this particular compound with the chlorine. So this phase transition, what does it look like? So here is, again, the crystal structure as seen uh, along the B direction. And what you see here is you have some anti-parallel displacements of a number of uh, ions. So this is chlorine, copper, and a bit of oxygen here. So this looks very nice because we have anti-parallel displacements. And also, it's completely one-dimensional. So this is the main difference with what you would have um, with, the, uh, with the pair of skites, typically. If you go for the dielectric anomalies, this is what you will find in the literature in this paper by Evan Constable some time ago. So they did measure the dielectric constant, and there is some kind of uh, anomaly here. Uh, unfortunately, back then, they were not really aware, so they measured it along the wrong direction. <laughs> so this has been done again, and this is some unpublished data now that shows you what the dielectric anomaly is like, so it's really significant. Not as sharp as less zirconate, but very comparable to what you would find in all those other uh, anti ferroelectric materials. Uh, so this is still unpublished data. Also coming soon, the infrared data. So they have been measured, and there is some interesting stuff here, but it's just a bit uh, too early today to be, um, uh, to be accurate about the analysis. Next thing we want to look at is the phonon band, so very much also in the uh, spirit of what uh, Jorge has been, has been discussing. So this is what it looks like for the high symmetry structure. You have actually a bunch of unstable modes, but essentially the feature that you're looking for is here. So you will find the most unstable mode is the Z1, so the anti electric one. And you have also an unstable mode at gamma that is just slightly, slightly less unstable. So that looks very good. And when you calculate, when you condense the two phonon modes, you find here a polyphase, and here are the anti-polyphase. Uh, this is PCN men, uh, and this is just three MeV per formula unit uh, higher, uh, which is essentially nothing. Okay, so it's really nearly degenerate. So this very, this also looks very good. This is Jorge's calculation, but also this was published before, uh, so it's not really new. So at this point, if I want to ask if francisite is anti electric, so I have the anti-parallel displacements, I have a symmetry lowering, that's really the most simple you can think of. You have a dielectric anomaly, you have a polyphase that's close in energy. Obviously, what's missing, like in many cases, is the um, electric field switching to a polyphase. So we've been trying to do that, obviously. Uh, we, we are not there yet, so I just wanted to show you what the crystals are like uh, in real life. So they grow in this kind of uh, very nice leaf shapes, but they are extremely thin, and you want to apply the electric field along this direction, okay? And obviously, because of this layer structure, I mean, it's kind of super difficult to prepare, so the only thing we have achieved so far is uh, to destroy the crystal. Um, so rest in pieces, poor. Uh, so we are, we are not giving up. I mean, we still are on it, but it's really technique. Uh, experimentally, it's quite of a challenge. Uh, but going back to my original motivation, I mentioned that this was um, um, a good candidate for a soft mode driven uh, anti-polar or anti electric uh, transition. So I want to go now to the spectroscopy experiment. So this is the phase transition at 115K as seen in Raman spectroscopy. Uh, so essentially the structure is complex. So you have many phonons, but what we want to focus on is this one here uh, at low frequency and it exhibits really a super nice soft mode behavior. Uh, this is the lowest temperatures, goes to zero here, and disappears, well, is not visible above TC. Uh, of course, you can do the usual fits of the Raman modes. These are the, the modes that do not move with the trans transition. Uh, and this is the soft mode here with uh, AG symmetry that goes down, and this is the damping that goes up close to the transition. So all this is uh, very uh, standard. 
Now, classically, uh, if we want to look for this mode uh, in the high symmetry phase, now there's two options, essentially. Either this transition is for electric, and in which case uh, we should be able to see this mode in infrared spectroscopy uh, here, or it's really antipolar, and then this mode is then at the zone boundary, and it can no longer be followed by the classical uh, optical spectroscopy techniques, which is why we went to uh, inelastic X-ray X -ray scattering. And this is what the uh, spectrum then looks like. So this is the, at the SRF ID28. Uh, at this Z point where we expect the instability, we do find a mode that is soft. There's also other modes up there, which is not a surprise, and given the complexity of the structure and the phonon modes uh, that uh, are the phonon calculations that I've shown you earlier. But essentially, uh, this mode is here. It's a bit frustrating because we are very much resolution limited uh, by, by the equipment, uh, but this has to do with the technique. Uh, also, in terms of uh, dispersion, so we went into measuring the phonon dispersion along two directions, so especially between gamma and Z. And the important fact here is that this soft phonon here is really found to harden uh, when you approach uh, gamma. Okay. Then, obviously, we want to do that with temperature, so this is what it looks like. Uh, room temperature is here at the bottom, uh, so it's still uh, quite, quite weak in a way, and as you approach the transition, it goes down in energy and, and up in intensity, and which we, when you fit this with a classical dumped harmonic oscillator model, you will find this kind also of soft mode behavior. Okay. Uh, now, again, this, this is a bit frustrating because we're resolution limited, so in order to get a more, uh, say, um, accurate picture, we also went from f to, to thermal diffuse scattering. So here the principle is that you will record uh, those maps in reciprocal space, and you're following the uh, diffuse scattering intensity uh, at the Z point. And if you assume that all this diffuse intensity, which you see here growing, comes dominantly from, from one soft phonon, then there is a quite a simple relation between this intensity and the frequency of the set phonon. Uh, so this is also another way that you can use in order to get back to the frequency up to some uh, scaling factor. But since we have the inelastic, the, the other measurements, we can scale in this. So this is what the final result look like. Um, the black square here are the uh, real inelastic spectra that you've seen before, and those two red and blue uh, data points, they are uh, what's been extracted from the diffuse scattering uh, intensity, and just again rescaled to match, uh, to match those values, but you see that the rescaling works really nicely and can be followed uh, quite low in energy. So in summary, we really have the soft mode uh, as we expected uh, in Raman spectroscopy and in the inelastic uh, uh, X-ray spectra. So if I put everything together and I plot, as we do usually, the energy squared uh, as a function of temperature, I get something like this. So again, that looks like really a nice um, soft mode behavior. Uh, you want uh, this behavior to be linear close to the transition, which is the case, I would say, in a reasonably uh, large temperature range. Uh, if you go a bit further down uh, here or up, obviously it starts deviating from linearity. So up there, I would argue that this can be due to some uh, like mode phonon coupling that makes uh, that breaks down a bit the, the soft phonon picture. I'll come back to that. And here I won't elaborate, but you might start also interacting with all the magnetism uh, that starts uh, at about those temperatures. So those are kind of expected, but the main message is that in in all this range, uh, close to the transition, it really behaves like a, a very nice uh, soft mode. Uh, so with this, I would like to go back now to the phonon calculation that, that you've seen earlier. So what we wanted to do was to uh, take those calculations and go a bit deeper into the analysis, check the atomic motions involved, and see if we can say something uh, about the atomistic picture. So here you have uh, like the, the relevant pieces of the phonon branches. This is for the um, uh, high symmetry phase. This is the low symmetry phase. Uh, to make it more easily comparable visually, this has been calculated already in the double cell. So this, this makes the comparison visually um, uh, easier. And also we have highlighted here the branches um, in pink that uh, corresponds to the fully symmetric branches that we would see, I mean, well, the modes that we would see typically in Raman spectroscopy. So the soft mode we're interested in uh, comes from here, and if you look at the uh, eigenvector, it's re really essentially chlorine. Uh, so this, uh, that's moving in anti-parallel fashion, so this is why uh, people have been arguing that this uh, transition can be seen as, only, as being only driven by this chlorine motion. 
Now, if we try to see how this mode now uh, translates, so to speak, to the low symmetry phase, you can make some projection and you realize that this chlorine motion uh, is essentially here, okay? And this mode there, which is the one that you would see or that you would assign to the mode seen in Raman spectroscopy, this one really is not only about chlorine, but it's, it's really a mixture of all those, so a bit of chlorine, oxygen, carbon, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the, the result of this analysis. So which confirms on the one hand that, uh, you, um, uh, that you do expect some lots of mode coupling, but this is not really surprising given the complexity of the structure, and that you can't just uh, be happy with this very simple atomistic picture with only uh, chlorine being involved, okay? Now there's a bit more to it. Um, so here I'm showing again the, um, uh, the phonon branches as calculated by Jorge, and I want to make a zoom uh, here on this part, so this is again between gamma and z, and this is the soft mode. Uh, so we have, again, uh, this one slightly lower, this one slightly higher. But then if really the phonon branch is that flat, the typical, uh, uh, typical reaction is that this should be an order-disorder transition. So it doesn't seem to really match with uh, the soft phonon that we are observing. Um, so the question is, why is that? Um, the quick answer for me as an experimentalist is, uh, you tell me. <laughs> I mean, the, the experimental data is there and probably that then you need to take into account the temperature effect in a real way and we are just facing a case where the DFT calculation at 0K does not really reflect what's happening with temperature. Okay, that's, that's not a huge problem. It's unusual, but it's not a fundamental problem. Uh, but there is a bit more to it. Uh, because, uh, so, more work is needed if you want to understand the transition with temperature. But there is a bit more to it if you think of what you're trying to do here. Because what you're trying to do is to have a, an unstable phonon mode here, uh, an unstable phonon mode here at gamma, and yet preserve something where the instability in reciprocal space is uh, really limited to a narrow uh, vicinity here at the Z point. So if I wanted to sketch the phonon branch corresponding to that, I would have to do something like this probably, or something a bit weird that doesn't look like something you find usually in this kind of phonon calculation. So this highlights to me the difficulty or the originality of this kind of transition, and just says that there is uh, more fun going on uh, with the system. So with this, I'm wrapping up with this example. So again, I would argue that in spite of its uh, complexity, I mean, this, this example, uh, this crystal gives us a very nice example of a phase transition. It's soft mode driven. It's one dimensional. It's non-ferroic. Uh, this also is an important point. Uh, there are, I pointed out some deviations from the ideality as you move away from DC, but not in a, a very critical way. And obviously, uh, the work in progress are the switching on the field which we still definitely need. The infrared and the dielectric responses, this is all also uh, ongoing. And then generally speaking, the exploration of the phase diagram, uh, including with pressure. So with this, I thank you for your attention. Any questions? Well, let me ask a quick one. Uh, is it known how the soft mode varies if you change the halogen? The, what, sorry? Is it known how the soft mode will change if you change the halogen from calculation? Uh, from the calculation, yes, it's known in this paper by Pushchenko. Essentially, what they find is that if you go to bromine, it is still slightly unstable, but less than chlorine. But still, experimentally, there is no phase transition. And if you go to yeah. iodine, then it's completely stable. It's completely stable. Yes. I see. Okay. Any questions from the audience? No? Oh, yeah. So maybe this is a, a question for uh, the, the last two speakers. So, I mean, in, in, in the case where the, the phonon branch is so flat, um, I mean, that's saying that the frequency is, is, is similar as you, you know, move along this transition. But um, what about the fourth order part of the potential energy surface, the depth of the of the of the wells as you as you displace is that also uh, similar at Z and gamma? Well, yeah, you can answer better probably. Well, we haven't checked explicitly, but it has to be very similar because the the depth of the minima ferroelectric and polar and antipolar are essentially the same. You know, the difference is three milli electron volt per formula unit. This is a big formula unit, so. 
it has to be really very similar. It makes sense. The chemi what happens, what controls the fourth order is the chemistry, the, the bond that you form or whatever. It needs the same thing at gamma and at the, at the sum boundary. So, you know, very similar. All right, well, let's thank the speaker again and move on.